Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nirav Shah, the director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and I am joined this afternoon with by Commissioner Jean Lambrew from Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Lambrew and I are here to provide everyone an update on where we stand with respect to COVID-19 for the state of Maine for today, Friday, December 4th, 2020. I begin today's update on yet another sad set of notes. Maine CDC has received the reports of four individuals of, in Maine who have died with COVID-19. The additional deaths reported today were among a woman in her 80s from Androscoggin County, a man in his 90s from Androscoggin County, a woman in her 50s from Oxford County, and a man in his 80s from York County. Before we go any further, I'd like to take a moment to offer our deepest condolences to the friends, families, and communities of these four individuals who have passed away. Their deaths mark collectively the 224th deaths of COVID-19 in Maine since we began our work. Overall, there are a total of 12,844 cases of COVID-19, an increase of 290 cases since yesterday alone. Of those, 11,390 are confirmed and 1,454 are probable cases. As I mentioned a moment ago, 224 individuals in Maine have died with COVID-19. Among yesterday's cases, approximately 18% were from Kennebec County and 16% were from Penobscot County. Turning to hospitalization data, cumulatively throughout COVID-19, 751 Maine people have been hospitalized. And just in the past month alone, 219 have been hospitalized. Right now, at present in Maine, there are 164 people hospitalized with COVID-19. Of those, 45 are in the intensive care unit and 119 are in non-intensive care unit beds. 17 of those individuals are on a ventilator. We wish them a safe and speedy recovery. Overall, 9,878 individuals have recovered and among our cases are 1,722 healthcare workers. Taking a turning now to outbreaks that Maine CDC has recently opened. Just today, Maine CDC has opened investigations into the following outbreaks. At the Capital Area Judicial Center, where we are aware of three cases, at the business office of C.N. Brown, where we are aware of 10 cases. At Freightliner of Maine, where we're aware of three cases. At Market Square Healthcare in South Paris in Oxford County, where we are aware of eight cases. At Southridge Rehab in Biddeford, three cases. At Spruce Mountain Elementary School in Jay, where we're also aware of three cases. Those are, the, those are the outbreak investigations that we have opened just today. Yesterday, Maine CDC opened the following investigations. At Acadia Hospital, where there are now a total of four cases. At Biddeford High School, a total of four cases. At the Biddeford Primary School, four cases. At the Cumberland County District Attorney's Office, where we're aware of three cases presently. At the Greeley High School, five cases. At Shaw House, which is an assisted living facility in York County, a total of eight cases, six among residents, two among staff. At St. Joseph Rehabilitation Facility in Portland, three cases, one of which among a resident and two of which are among staff members. And finally, at York Middle School, where we are aware of four cases. These are the epidemiological outbreak investigations that we have launched just, in, just since the last time I spoke with everyone. And finally, we have reopened an investigation into the Guy Rowe School in Norway, where we had previously opened an investigation, had closed it, but we have now reopened it 
where there are a total of 12 cases. Turning to testing for just a moment. Right now, the PCR positivity rate on a seven day basis in Maine stands at 4.87%. Our testing volume right now for PCR tests in Maine stands at 540 tests for every 100,000 people. As I mentioned not long ago, we now have sufficient and stable data with respect to antigen testing as well in Maine. As a reminder, we have received uh, several hundred thousand antigen tests from the US government and have been deploying them across Maine, including at a number of Walgreens facilities. We've started to receive those data. And right now, the positivity rate for antigen tests in Maine stands at 4.27%. Now, I'd like to take a moment to talk about a number of items that we have had going on here at Maine CDC and Maine DHHS over the past couple of days. The first is some changes with respect to quarantine. The second is an update on where we stand with vaccines. And the third is a discussion of where we are with respect to the significant increase in new cases that we've got. Let's start with where we are on quarantine. The United States CDC recently issued a scientific brief regarding the latest data on the duration of quarantine. Now, recall that quarantine is the term for what happens after you've had a close contact with someone who is known to have COVID-19. The reason quarantine is so important is that we use it to break the chain of potential transmission from person to person to person. If everyone who is exposed to the virus strictly quarantined, they would have no one to spread the virus to. The US CDC has been studying how long that period of strict quarantine should or can last. Up until now, it has been 14 days. But the US CDC reviewed data on a single question, which is, can it be shorter while simultaneously and still keeping people who are exposed to COVID-19 from spreading it to others? And according to the latest scientific brief from the US CDC, the answer to that question is yes. The US CDC found that shortening the quarantine period from 14 days to 10 days is an acceptable option for states and jurisdictions. Our team of clinicians, scientists, and epidemiologists carefully, carefully reviewed the US CDC's scientific findings to understand their potential impact on Maine. And after that review, we are changing the definition of quarantine in Maine. Effective today and on a going forward basis, individuals who are close contacts of cases of COVID-19 will only need to quarantine for 10 days, not 14 days. We still recommend that individuals in quarantine get tested, ideally five to seven days after exposure. But as with before, a negative test does not shorten the 10-day quarantine period. So why are we doing all of this? Well, let's just acknowledge one fact. Quarantine is really hard. Being in quarantine means being out of work. It means being away from your family. It means detaching from your community. Quarantine is an important public health measure, but it comes at great private cost. Cost to the individual and perhaps even on their workplace, if, for example, they work in a healthcare setting. The bottom line is the sooner that we exposed, resume their regular rhythms of daily life, the better off we'll be. And we believe that moving from the 14 day to the 10 day quarantine window as analyzed by US CDC and as affirmed by our scientists and epidemiologists is a move that we can make that will help people stay safe help them reduce the likelihood of spreading it to others, while also helping them get back to those regular rhythms of daily life. 
The second update I want to provide to everybody is where we stand with our vaccine planning efforts. Not too long ago, Maine CDC received word that we would be receiving up to 36,000 doses of vaccine. We initially saw those numbers on the computer dashboard, on the dashboard that we share with the US CDC in Operation Warp Speed. But then we saw that those numbers very quickly changed thereafter. We started asking questions as we've talked about. One of the ways that we asked those questions and sought assistance with this was through the members of our through the members of our congressional delegation. We very quickly engaged with the delegation who in turn helped us engage with the United States Department of Health and Human Services to help us get answers about what was going on and why we were seeing these changes in the numbers. I'd like to take a moment to thank the members of our congressional delegation and all of their staff for helping us get the facts so that we can share those facts with you. We learned with the assistance of our delegation a few things. That production, for example, of the Pfizer vaccine had changed, different from what was initially projected. We also saw that the we also learned that Operation Warp Speed was changing their allotment strategy. Rather than one large allotment, they were breaking it into smaller allotments. Again, I'd like to take a second to thank the members of the delegation for helping us uncover what was going on and therefore allowing us to make sure that our planning process was operating off of the best available facts. Today, Maine CDC and Maine DHHS have placed our first order of vaccines. We have placed an order for 12,675 vaccines. Now I use the term order, but really what we have done is indicated to the US CDC and to Operation Warp Speed where we would like our first shipments of vaccine to go. And we've identified a number of sites across Maine, five of which are hospitals, one of which is the Maine CDC Central Warehouse. As we've discussed, Maine will be following recommendations from the US CDC's Expert Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which met not long ago to help states get guidance on where we should begin our vaccination efforts. And the opinion of that Expert Advisory Committee is that Maine should be focused, and all states should be focused on, for example, frontline healthcare workers, and soon nursing home residents. In short, we should be focusing our vaccine planning efforts on first vaccinating vulnerable people and those who provide care to them. That is why our first week's order will be focused on, again, making sure vaccine goes to hospitals for frontline healthcare workers, and then very soon, is in, in partnership with commercial pharmacies, making sure that residents of long-term care facilities, nursing homes, can soon be vaccinated. Now, I wanna stress one really important thing. This was just the first week's allocation. This was week one of what will be many, many weeks. Our vaccination efforts in Maine and across the country will again continue for weeks, if not months. And as we go through that process, we will begin moving into vaccinating different populations across the state of Maine. I wanna end by talking about what our twin guiding principles will be. We will be focused on velocity and equity. What I've told my team at the Maine CDC is every morning, I wanna know the answers to two questions. How many people did we vaccinate yesterday? And just as important, did we vaccinate the right people yesterday? The first question is about velocity. The second question is about equity. Both of those questions, both of those guiding principles will guide how we continue to vaccinate people all across the state of Maine. The third thing I wanna talk about today is where we stand with respect to the increasing number of new cases in Maine and what we're doing about it. Ever since we have started our work on COVID-19, I have pledged to make sure to give everyone the facts in Maine as to where we stand and to make sure that if the news isn't good, 
that you hear it from me first. I continue that today. As everyone is aware, the number of new positive cases in Maine has continued to increase significantly, not just in the past few weeks, but just in the past few days. Again, the increase we've seen just in the past couple of days, just this week, comes on top of an increase that we were already experiencing going back five or six weeks. We are now facing a situation where things were already acute before, and now they have become even more so just this week. This is a reflection of a confluence of factors. Number one is the continued, sustained, ferocious levels of community transmission across the state. Layering on top of that, we are starting to see the possible beginning of spread that was linked to and that may have occurred over the recent Thanksgiving holiday. All of those things have generated a record number of outbreaks. Those outbreaks in turn increase the level of community transmission, feeding into a vicious cycle. These forces mean that the number of new positive case reports that Maine CDC receives every day has continued to increase significantly. Yesterday, we shattered our one day record of, num of the number of new cases. And just today we came close to having 300 new cases. I fear that this may sadly be our new normal. And even worse, I expect it to get worse, perhaps even far worse. Our positivity rate just 14 days ago, one incubation period ago, was 2.8%. It's 4.9% now. 30 days ago, we were wringing our hands when our positivity rate hit 1.5%. 30 days later, it's more than three times that. As cases from Thanksgiving may continue to be diagnosed, the number of Maine people who continue to test positive will continue to increase. And as a result, Maine people and Maine communities will continue to feel the effects of the virus. Maine CDC is not immune to that. We are continuing our efforts to stay on top of things. But as the number of cases has continued to increase significantly, that becomes a challenge. It also means that we have to focus our resources on individual cases where we can do the most public health good, focusing our resources on those with the highest need or who are at the highest risk. This will sadly entail making some very difficult choices. We are evaluating this weekend what those changes may be and what they will look like. They will be difficult. I will have an update for everybody on Monday of what those chases, choices entail and what they mean for everybody. But for now, I wanted to make sure that everyone was hearing from me directly about the situation we're in, the difficult choices that we are facing, and the choices that we will have to make going into next week. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to our colleagues in the media. Commissioner Lambrew and I are happy to take any questions the first question of the afternoon goes to John from WGME. Hi, Dr. Shaw. My question is about this year's flu season during the pandemic. Some of the most recent weekly flu surveillance reports show far fewer cases than this time last year. So do you have any theories about why flu cases are down as COVID-19 continues to spread? And do you think that trend will continue? Sure, John. That's a great question. It's one that we've talked about and I've chatted about with a colleague of mine as well. The, the fact one, there's one very important epidemiological fact to bear in mind, John, which is that COVID-19 spreads far more quickly and easily than the flu. So measures that we may already all be taking, like wearing face coverings and maintaining physical distance, may be very effective at reducing the flu. But because COVID-19 is far more vicious and spreads far more quickly, easily, and forcefully than the flu, those measures, though they may be effective at reducing influenza rates, may not have the same impact at reducing COVID-19 rates. Let me be very clear. 
Those measures are critical. They still are useful at reducing COVID-19 rates, but they may be even more useful at reducing the rates of the flu. They remain critical, but just bear in mind that the same, the same step, the same measure may have an outsized impact based on the fact that these viruses are different. The other thing to bear in mind, John, is that flu season is just ramping up. Right now in Maine, we are just now entering the weeks at which flu activity starts to increase at a significant rate. So let's hope that these measures that we're taking, that everyone continues them so we can keep a check on flu rates. The last thing we need right now with ever increasing hospitalizations is a twin pandemic, a twin demic of COVID-19 with influenza by its side. Thank you for that very thorough answer as expected. And I have one more question for our sports director, David. He's wondering if you were the commissioner could tell us if Monday is still a go for high school winter sports to begin in Maine. So we have been in contact with the Maine Principals Association, which does govern school-based sports. And our understanding is that while Monday will begin skills and drills, that kind of exercise that is separate, masked, physically distanced in relatively small groups. But the idea of bringing teams together for group practices, as well as for, for scrimmages will be postponed to January 4th. We will be aligning our community sports guidance to do the same. And the rationale is that while we have seen this increase in COVID-19 spread in Maine, we still strive to do everything we can to keep our schools open for in-person learning when it's safe. Cutting down on potential spread through sports practices and scrimmages could help us keep our schools open during the critical next few weeks. That's all from WGME today. Thank you both, we appreciate it. Thanks, John. Uh, we're gonna turn to Patrick Whittle next. Thank you very much to you both. A um, couple things. Uh, is it uh, possible for us to get an update on the status of uh, Governor Mills' coronavirus test? Do we know if she's had it yet and when we might have a result? And um, I, uh, I, I understand that you're holding off until Monday until sort of revealing some of these difficult, difficult choices, but I, I'm assuming that some of them in some of them involve what you were just talking about regarding winter sports. Is that a fair thing to say? Uh, I think we're announcing our sports today because oh, okay. we really want to make sure to the previous question, there is a schedule that begins the, again, skills and drills on Monday. And there's been lots of questions about what that means is, and while we maintain that overlaying some of our public health measures, we are postponing this start of practices and scrimmages to the new year. But I think that's different than what Dr. Shaw was talking about. Yeah, Patrick, um, the choices that we are contemplating right now would involve uh, main CDC operations in terms of how we, how we work on investigating cases and some hard choices we'll have to make there. Uh, and then with respect- oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 my no, it's, um, it, they're, they're going to be unsavory choices. They are sadly choices that some other states have had to confront as well. Um, and, um, and, and we're working on that this weekend with the team to determine where we land. Uh, and with respect to your first question, uh, Commissioner Wambrew and I both were on a call with the governor uh, earlier today and uh, uh, she reported feeling great um, in terms of her healthcare and personal healthcare matters. I think we'd refer you to the governor's office for those. Okay, terrific. And it's, it's good to know that in terms of symptoms, she's not experiencing any, experiencing any right now. We can extrapolate mm -hmm. that from feeling great. Uh, yes, yes. All right, thank you very much. Sure, Patrick. Uh, I'm gonna turn to Eric Russell at the Press Herald next. Uh, good afternoon, thanks for taking my question. Um, I had a question about vaccines, if I could. Given what happened earlier this week with the confusion about the shipment and 36,000 down to 12,000, I knew we were able to remedy it with some help from the delegation. But you know, given that and given some other challenges, how do you sort of ensure transparency and trust in this process going forward? Yeah, you know, I mean, Eric, you 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 put your finger on it. I mean, a lot of this process is about transparency and trust. Um, 
I think the way that we ensure it is by asking hard questions uh, and making sure we'll we are following up sometimes with the assistance of our delegation, sometimes directly uh, with, with principals at the federal level to make sure we get answers. Um, I'll, I'll mention two things. Uh, I had the opportunity with some colleagues across the Northeast this morning to be on a call with General Perna personally. And uh, we put some of these difficult questions to him as well and made sure we were getting answers and that the answers that he was giving us square with what we've been told elsewhere. That's one way. Uh, the, the other thing is um, I, governors have recommended to the federal government that all of this information about allocations and what states are getting be placed on one public website so that not just states know what we are each getting in our own state, but everybody knows what the states are getting. So we can see if things change, whether there are some that got more and others that got less, so we can focus our questions that way. But for us, I think for Commissioner Lambrew and I, the first step of that is asking tough questions on behalf of Maine people. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Patty White next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. In terms of the state's vaccine distribution plan, where do independent primary care doctors fit in the lineup? Are they in that first priority group or does that mostly apply to healthcare workers in hospital settings? No, Patty, they are, they are within that phase 1A of healthcare providers uh, and healthcare providers being a deliberately broad term for anybody paid or unpaid who in a healthcare setting may come into contact with someone who has COVID or infectious material that could transmit COVID. So it's a broad term. Outpatient, I actually spoke just yesterday evening with a, a, a outpatient primary care physician who was posing this question. And um, our focus right now for the first part of 1A is more hospital-based uh, uh, employees. Uh, those in, for example, emergency departments, ICUs, COVID units, but not far behind will be those who are taking care of folks in an outpatient setting. I wanna be really clear, you know, right now we're just talking about literally the first week, a couple of days, five, six, seven days after that first week, we'll have week two and week three. And, and, and that's where we're starting to figure out, we haven't landed on it yet, but that's where we are figuring out where outpatient practices will fall. Okay, great. Um, and we're approaching 5% uh, positivity right now. And in the spring, that was kind of the threshold for when states could reopen after stay-at-home orders. I know you look at several, you know, metrics before deciding whether additional state actions are necessary, but is that 5% positivity rate still kind of a, a threshold that you look to? So it, this will be a, the, the answer is yes, but, but not so much in the way. So um, I'll try to be more precise and clear. Yes, but, but in a different way. Earlier on in the pandemic, the 5% threshold, which was a number developed on a model uh, created by the World Health Organization, was used as a marker to determine whether there was, generally speaking, enough testing going on. So it was more a metric for testing volume as opposed to a gauge of severity. Again, it came at a time when testing was at a premium and it was thought by the WHO's model that once you hit 5%, you were at a point where you were able to get decent visibility into the dynamics of the outbreak or pandemic in your particular jurisdiction. The value of the positivity rate has changed since then. It still has value, but it tells us a different thing, which is just how much more, uh, how much more spread there is. Testing volumes in Maine have stabilized at a very high level. There's fluctuations, of course, but they remain at a high level. And so the positivity rate now tells us something different, less about testing availability and more about increasing transmission at the community level. Um, I don't know that we have ever sort of looked to one metric and applied it in an algorithmic or formulaic fashion to make decisions about public health policy. I don't think we'll do that now. It is, it's again a a constellation of factors that we look to to make these very difficult policy decisions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next, over to Bob Evans at News Center. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Shaw, in the past, you have talked about the need for federal funding to distribute the vaccine. What happens if it doesn't come, or at least not in time for distribution to begin? 
I'll, I'll start that and then in, invite Commissioner Wambrew to discuss as well. Uh, Bob, we'll get the job done. That's what we do at the Maine CDC. It's what we do every day. We do the impossible and the hard every single day. But what's at stake with respect to the funding is the velocity. That, that, that one of two guiding principles that I mentioned, the funding or the assets that we are able to secure from our federal colleagues will help us achieve actually both velocity and equity. Uh, the, the, having robust resources means that we can have a logistic system that gets the vaccine to where it needs to be in a manner that keeps it cold with the resources that vaccinators need to have in order to be properly reimbursed and have everything they need to administer the vaccine. So for us, it's a combination of making sure we can, we can vaccinate with velocity and with equity. The more resources that we've got to do that, the more fully we can achieve both of those goals. Uh, Commissioner? The way the federal government has structured funding for the COVID vaccine is through two mechanisms. First, it says that all types of insurance will pay providers for administering the vaccine, Medicare, Medicaid or main care, private insurance. And second, it is purchasing itself, the Pfizer and the Moderna and all the other potential vaccines and distributing it and paying for the cost of that distribution. The challenge we see, however, is that there's going to be gaps between the private insurance and the distribution from the federal government. So for example, we're, we're undertaking an effort to educate people in Maine about the vaccine and about the strengths of it. That's something that we don't get federal funding for in a significant way. We're training people here in the state of Maine, not getting funding for that. We're building IT infrastructure, not really getting sufficient funding for that. And when it comes down to groups like emergency medical services are gonna to try to pitch in, hard for them to build insurance to do that. So we will, we will be able to do, as Dr. Shaw said, what we need to do. We can do it better and faster and fairer with resources. And this is why just this morning, Governor Mills was talking to our congressional delegation about this very topic. We are hopeful that our delegation working with leaders in Congress will be able to secure some funding for states to administer the vaccine. But again, we'll, we'll do what we need to do regardless. Thank you. And I have one more question, if I may. Um, with COVID-19 cases still on the rise, Dr. Shaw, uh, is there any way to put into perspective how ill people who get COVID-19 are here in Maine? Meaning, is there a way to say what percentage of people have a mild case, what percentage have it severely, and what percentage may have it somewhere in the middle? Sure, Bob. Um, you know, the best proxy for severity of illness is the number of folks who have been hospitalized. Uh, so that for us is how we think about uh, the, those categories. For someone to be hospitalized, it means that a physician in Maine said, you're not good, you're not, you're not safe on your own. You need to be somewhere where people are looking after you. That is one of the best proxies for severity. And to put that number in perspective, you know, our hospitalization rates overall with about 750 people hospitalized as, as, as a fraction of about 12,800 cases, puts us in line with where other states have been. The other number that we look at is the percentage of individuals who are in an intensive care unit bed as a fraction of all of those who are hospitalized. And we actually dug into that number a little bit earlier this week to understand it a little bit more. And we uncovered some interesting findings, that the bottom line of which was that although we, it initially looked like our numbers were not in line with other states, when we started talking to hospitals, it turns out that they were very much in line with what we're seeing. So uh, COVID-19 has been incredibly challenging for everybody in Maine who has experienced it or knows someone who has experienced it. It's affected all of our lives, but it has done so in a manner, thankfully, that has been on par with what we've seen in other states. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn next to Amy Brown at WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, can you say a little bit more about what you're seeing uh, specifically related to holiday travel or gatherings and whether uh, you'll continue to provide updates as people are starting to think about planning for the next set of holidays? 
As to the latter, Amy, we will most certainly continue to provide updates as well as the best available guidance for individuals and their families as they are contemplating their holiday plans. I'll tell you on a personal note, my family and I have talked about what our holiday plans will be, which is essentially a series of Zoom meetings uh, and, and Zoom uh, get togethers on different days and afternoons. Uh, my view is that as we go into the holidays, as with Thanksgiving, it's okay to delay. That's what I've been telling my family. Uh, in terms of the data, you know, we are continuing to see that individuals report who, who have tested positive for COVID report not having attended large gatherings, not having been located at a site of a known outbreak, which again is by implication suggestive of a lot of transmission happening at the family, around the family room and small gatherings in homes. As we go through more and more cases that may be related to Thanksgiving, we're trying to better characterize that. Okay, great. And you mentioned at the last briefing, I think it was, that it's not recommended that people use testing to determine whether or not they've recovered because of the strain that we'll put on testing supplies. With the increased demand on testing, at some point will the state be, and maybe this is more for you, Commissioner Lambrou, will the state be uh, looking at whether or not uh, we should continue to encourage people who are traveling for optional travel to rely on testing and go back to just having a quarantine for that? Or will some other measures be put in place to protect the testing supply? So for now, our state testing capacity, as Dr. Shaw said earlier, remains robust. We continue to have sometimes some spikes when there's a week with multiple outbreaks. Sometimes we see a unexpected surge in demand for our testing capacity, but for the most part, we feel as though we've built sufficient capacity, but it always can be better and more. We're working on increased staff, increased testing options for the state, as well as looking beyond the horizon. The federal government had been providing us with Abbott ID Now rapid test kits, for example, that's ending at the end of the month. The federal government has been providing us with Buy Next Now shipments. Those have slowed down. Um, we understand in part because of a supply chain issue, but nonetheless, we are reliant on those Buy Next Now tests. That also is scheduled to end earlier. We heard the end of the year now has been pushed into December to, into January. So we are always looking to expand our testing options. We're not yet at a point where we need to change our testing policy. We do have a standing order at the department. That means that anyone can get a test without a referral from their provider, but we do urge people who are not at elevated risk, who have not been traveling, to not get a test. Okay, Amy, I, I, Amy, I wanted to, sorry, I, I wanted to just clarify one important point. According to the US CDC and Maine CDC, the reasons we do not recommend a test-based strategy for release from isolation one is the one. One is what you mentioned, which is uh, it, it incurs additional testing at a time when, although we have great capacity, it's still a precious resource. But the other, from an epidemiological perspective, is that the tests can still pick up little errant pieces of the virus in somebody's body, but not actually to suggest that they are actually capable of infecting it, uh, infecting anybody. So it doesn't really answer the question we're asking. And that's the, that's the real reason why Maine CDC and the U.S. CDC do not uh, or it, it recommend testing. I should say it's the principal reason. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. And just a real quick follow-up, not really a follow-up, but just trying to get a third question in here under the wire. Are medical examiners in the state regularly testing people for COVID if they die of uh, what seems like maybe natural causes that could be related? I'm not sure. I know that they have tested some individuals of COVID, but I don't know if that's their standard protocol. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go next to Allison Ross. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Um, just a few questions today on vaccine distribution. So the first, what can you share about that dry run that was done earlier this week? How did that go and did it bring up anything that maybe showed changes needed to be made? And then just one quick follow up after that. Yeah, sure, Allison. So the uh, we we did uh, participate with our federal partners 
uh, in a quote dry run, uh, which is essentially a system or a setup to make sure that we have everything in place uh, so that the moment a vaccine is boxed up and starts its journey to Maine, we can keep track of it. We have eyes on it. We know when it's arriving. Once it arrives, we can practice taking out the boxes, putting them into ultra cold storage, so on and so forth. Uh, the reports that I received from my team were that the dry one run went well. Uh, I know that they, the team is doing what's called an after action to collaborate, sit down virtually and determine what we learned that we should change our processes for going forward. Uh, I haven't seen that after action report yet, but that's a standard thing after an event of that nature. Okay, great. And then my second question here would either be for Commissioner Lambrew or you, Dr. Shaw. So on Wednesday, Governor Mills expressed some concern over hearing that states will need to pay for aspects of getting this vaccine to people. So do we have any idea how much of a cost we're talking about? And overall, as a whole, do we have any figures on the cost of this? Well, I'll start and then again, I invite the commissioner to chime in. You know, Allison, one of the things that's difficult here is that the, 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 the overall cost of this depends so much on the type of vaccine that we receive and the proportion of say the Pfizer vaccine, which requires ultra cold storage and special handling, the proportion of that we get versus other vaccines, which don't have those handling requirements. So much of where we go uh, from, a, for example, from a logistics perspective will depend on which vaccine is produced in greater quantities, which one states receive preferentially over the other. That's one of the challenges that we're facing right now another reason why having those resources provided by the federal government would help our planning process so much. And we've seen various estimates at the national level of six to $8 billion as a down payment is again, hard to say without knowing some of the precise details, but it is a major undertaking to try to get here in Maine to 1.3 million people and nationwide to hundreds of millions of people. So. We appreciate the fact that this is something unlike anything we've done in a long time here in this country. It will take resources and at the state level, we know we can do it faster, fairer and better with resources. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go over to Evan Pop next. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, so this is a question from a reader, um, probably for Commissioner Lambrew. Um, so this reader is over 65, uh, has a pre-existing condition, lost their job because of the pandemic and is receiving very limited unemployment benefits. And they're looking for a job, but are wondering how to square the guidance being provided that people over the age of 65 are more vulnerable to the virus and that in-person settings could be dangerous with them for them with the fact that many of the jobs available in Maine are in-person. And so I was wondering if you have any advice you could share for um, someone in that type of situation and whether the state has any initiatives to address that kind of situation. Sure. So Commissioner Fortman at the Department of Labor has focused on populations like this individual, those who may be struggling not just with unemployment during the pandemic, but with you know, age, age and demographics or health problems that make it particularly challenging. We do have our career centers here in Maine who do provide that kind of personalized assistance going online at the Department of, of Labor, there are ways that people can find a, a 1-800 number or an email to get this kind of assistance. Our recommendation is that we look, that this individual do, does look for that kind of help that we do offer here in Maine to try to help people get back on their feet. I would note that we are hopeful that Congress does extend unemployment benefits. As everybody knows, what was passed earlier expires on the day after Christmas, December 26th. So we all are quite focused on the need to try to continue support because while the unemployment may end, the pandemic hasn't. Thank you. Uh, over to Caitlin Andrews at the BDN. Hi, Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Lambrew. Uh, long time no speak. Um, I have two questions. One is, can you talk a little bit about how the um, hospitals or, you know, healthcare centers that are first in line for the vaccine, you know, how did you select them? What was the criteria? Sure, Caitlin. Um, so one of the top criteria was, do they have an ultra cold storage capacity? 
and do they have enough ultra cold storage capacity to accommodate the lot size of the Pfizer vaccine? The Pfizer vaccine comes in 975 lot dose packs and it can't be broken up. So question number one is, does the facility have that requisite ultra cold storage capacity, uh, capability? Sorry, let me say that again. The, the twin questions were, does the facility have the requisite ultra storage, ultra cold storage capability and capacity? Those were the, mo those were the most critical questions. Uh, when we took a look at that, what we really found was just a handful of hospitals across the state. The second question was, again, our, our other focus, one focus is velocity, the other focus was equity. We wanted to make sure that even the first week's doses were equitably distributed geographically across the state of Maine. And thus, we wanted to make sure that that's where they will go. So the first week's doses will be distributed all the way up from AR Gould all the way down to Portland and, and, and multiple points in between. So those were some of the principles that we used as, as we were going through the process. Thank you. And my second question um, is kind of about the changes that you said may be coming ahead and how the CDC handles cases. Um, I know in New Hampshire, they scaled back their contact tracing to really only focus on high risk populations. Do you see those changes maybe occurring in that measure or something else along those lines? Um, Caitlin, again, this is, um, this is gonna be a tough set of choices that we've got in front of us. And I, I just, I wanna take the opportunity again to just tell people that th there are no easy choices anymore where we are. Uh, some of the choices that we've made to date have been difficult, but we're, they still allowed us to conduct full investigations, for example. From here on out, given the significant increase in the number of cases we've seen, the choices that we have to make going forward will be really hard. Again, I wanna make sure everybody is aware of the situation we're facing and that you hear about it from us, you hear about it from me first. Uh, Galen, we're contemplating some of the options that other states have already had to make. You referenced one in New Hampshire. I've had conversations with counterparts of mine in a couple of dozen other states about, uh, given that other states have suffered more uh, sooner, other states have found themselves in the position that we are in. In recent weeks, I've had the opportunity to speak with them about the choices that they've faced. I'm not gonna speculate about where we will land in our discussions over the weekend and into Monday, but some of the things that you noted, Caitlin, uh, changing the way that we uh, conduct case investigations and potentially contact tracing, those are in the cards. Our hope is to be able to focus our resources on the highest risk individuals and those who may in turn go on to spread the disease to others so we can focus on them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna go next to Emily Tadlock at WABI to close us out for the afternoon. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Um, my first one, my first question is just, uh, you know, a number question. I'm wondering if I can get an update on cases and possible deaths at Winterberry Heights and the Island Nursing Home. Okay. Um, so at Winterberry, uh, we are aware right now, um, let me get the exact numbers there for you. Uh, we are aware of I'm gonna confirm the exact numbers actually. I wanna make sure I get that right. My numbers are as of about 8 a.m. 8 this morning, and I believe they may have changed. Uh, but sadly there at Winterberry, Emily, we are aware of seven deaths, uh, which, which, is, which is deeply saddening to us. Uh, with respect to Island Nursing Home, uh, they have been getting results of their universal round of testing, uh, which occurred on Wednesday. And so their numbers have been, their, their case results have been coming in throughout the course of the day. The latest numbers that I have, which are again, as of 8 a.m. this morning, uh, indicated that there are a total of 47 cases at Iowa Nursing Home. That number may have increased even since this morning. And sadly there, we are aware of three deaths. Okay, and then um, my second question is about, um, you said that you expect um, more um, shipments of vaccines. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate that on that a little bit. Um, you said this will just be the initial. Do you know of how many you should be getting uh, as we go forward? Uh, we, we do. Uh, we've been, we've been in, it's, um, 
Operation Warp Speed has briefed us on what we should expect to receive, not just for the first week, the order of which we put in today, but at least through week three. So weeks two, as well as week three. Um, in, and we'll get you the exact numbers, but in general, what we anticipate receiving after this initial first week is that we will receive at least two more weekly allocations of an additional 12,675 doses of the Pfizer vaccine. That's for the folks who got the first dose. That's essentially their second dose being held in reserve. And then approximately 24,200 doses of, uh, of the Moderna vaccine. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna, this is gonna get a little confusing, but when we start getting the Moderna vaccine, whenever that is, it'll be 24,200 the first week and approximately 10,700 in subsequent weeks. All of that is subject to change. And really, as General Perna indicated to my colleagues and me this morning, that really is just for the first three weeks. They're working on their planning and, um, and projections for weeks four, five, and six right now. Those, that was a lot of numbers. I'll get those to you separately. They're also in the press release that's going out soon, but um, we'll get you those numbers separately. Okay. And then just how are you feeling about um, how they're rolling out this vaccine in terms of the amount that we're getting? Um, again, it is initially lower than we expected, and you kind of talked about that a little bit, but um, as someone who's kind of in charge here, how are you feeling about how they're doing this? Well, I, uh, I, I have mixed feelings. Uh, certainly, uh, I, I wanted to try to get as much vaccine as soon as possible for everybody in Maine, but we recognize that vaccines right now are a very scarce commodity. So uh, I, I also recognize that our partners are at the federal level, as well as at the ground level here in, in the state of Maine, at the hospital level, et cetera, are facing really difficult logistical challenges. So there are so many moving pieces. Um, my focus right now is on making sure that every decision we make is in line with and informed by those twin guiding principles, doing so with equity and doing so with velocity. And that's how I'm thinking about every single decision we make. As I mentioned a moment ago, what I've told my team is every morning, once we start vaccinating, whenever that is, I wanna come into the office and I wanna see an email indicating the answers to two questions. Who do, how many people did we vaccinate yesterday? And more importantly, were they the right people? That's what I want to know every single day. Thank you. Well, thank you all for your time this afternoon. Uh, that was the last question for the afternoon. And so to close us out, I'd like to just kind of recap a lot of the news from today. Changes to the quarantine policy in Maine from 14 days to 10 days, hopefully allow, allowing people to stay safe, prevent the virus from infecting others if they've got it, as well as allowing people to get back into their communities with their families and in their workplaces more quickly. On top of that, our first orders of a potential COVID-19 vaccine that we placed, hoping to be able to get those into the arms of frontline healthcare workers and soon thereafter, nursing home residents as soon as possible with the aim of protecting the most vulnerable people in Maine, as well as those who care for them. But sadly, that news, those pieces of positive news come at a distressing time when the number of new cases in Maine continues to increase week upon week upon week. And with it, sadly, hospitalizations, and then shortly, sadly after that, deaths. All of those changes prompting us at the Maine CDC to confront some very difficult choices. We're going to be working on those all weekend, and I'll have more updates for you on all of that on Monday. But in the meantime, as always, I ask everyone to please be kind, take care of one another. We'll talk again next week.